Welcome to MBCF at Home. It is great to have you with us today. Whether this is your first time joining us or whether you join us regularly, great to have you with us. Today we are continuing on in our series looking at some of the core teachings that Jesus brought on the Sermon on the Mount. Today we're wrestling with the topic of what is this thing called the Old Testament and how does it relate to Jesus uh, and how do we handle the law uh, as given in the Old Testament as Christians. So if that interests you then please do stick around. In just a minute's time, we'll be joining our teaching over in North Berwick High School. But first, let me just introduce myself. Uh, my name's Neil, uh, and together with my wife, Jo, we are the leaders here of NBCF. We are a church that meets here in North Berwick in East Lothian, Scotland. Um, and uh, we would love to see you along if you ever wanted to join us. If you live locally, uh, we meet at North Berwick High School uh, and we gather people from across East Lothian so do feel welcome to join us 10.30 a.m. on Sundays at North Berwick High School. We also of course have our online community that watches uh, with us on YouTube and that's at 7 p.m. on Sundays. You can watch along live or you can um, catch up during the week. Uh, either way, whether you're uh, someone who normally joins us in person or whether you're watching online today. Uh, we just want to build community, so um, don't let this just be a broadcast. Leave us a comment or um, send us an email, and my email address is below, uh, and you can be involved in what we're doing. If you want to also, we have our weekly email. You can sign up for the NBCF Connect. It just updates you on the news and the events, the things that are happening throughout the week. Um, so uh, that's a great way to stay in touch with what we're doing. But as I say, we're about to join our teaching over at North Berwick High School. Um, but before we do that, let me just pray uh, and then we will transfer you over there. Lord, we thank you um, for your goodness towards us. We thank you for sending your son to, to die for us, to be a sacrifice for us. And today, God, as we open up your words in the Bible, uh, as we open up your teaching, Jesus, we, we pray you'd make it come to life for us. Help us to make sense of things that previously haven't made sense and help uh, us to engage with your spirit as you teach us and disciple us today. Amen. So let's join with our teaching now. So today, as I say, we're continuing on in our series uh, looking at uh, the Sermon on the Mount. So um, if you are following along, that's Matthew 5 to 7. And so in the coming months, um, we're gonna, we'll take a wee break at Christmas time, but we are going to look at this for a while. We're going to be working our way through Matthew 5, 6, and 7 uh, and exploring it. And obviously, uh, we are, this, is, uh, this is us just starting off this series in some ways, but recently we did a series on discipleship, looking at what is a disciple, how do we follow Jesus. And this series very much follows on from that. This is the teaching, the core of, of Jesus' message and what it means to follow him. Um, and so where are we today? Well, we had the Beatitudes. Joe did a great job of expounding the Beatitudes. I found that really a helpful message to rethink how I think about the Beatitudes. And then last week, uh, we had Phil and Julie Arbin with us, and Phil shared brilliantly on looking at the metaphors of salt and light. So this week, we come to verses 17 to 20. Uh, and it's important, of course, that we remember that the verse and the chapter divisions aren't there in the original uh, verses. But this section we're looking at today is very much like a change in section in Jesus' teaching. This is like a little introduction today that's going to almost highlight what we're going to look at in the following weeks. This little section here is like the precursor, and then Jesus is going to go on and explain it in more detail. So let's, without further ado, let's read our passage, and it's Matthew 5, 17 to 20. And it says this, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have, come to I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be gr called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. 
So Jesus is, uh, he doesn't mess around with his words here. He's quite straight and he's quite direct. And perhaps as a Christian living so far distant from Jesus' time and the history of it all, you've wrestled with questions like, what do we do with the Old Testament? You know, we've got that huge section of, the, of our Bible today, which is the Old Testament. And many people wrestle with it. They're like, great, I can get down with the Gospels. I can understand the ministry of Jesus. But how do we handle the Old Testament where it seems... It seems different. It seems harder for us to relate to. Surely if we've got Jesus, we don't need all the backstory that goes before. Maybe you've asked, how do the two connect or struggled to understand where they they come together? And of course, when Jesus begins his ministry, he comes onto the scene and he gets the comment comment that he gets often is that he's a teacher who speaks with authority. Uh, Later in Matthew 7, it says, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowd were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. So Jesus appears and he starts teaching with real authority to the people that he's speaking to. And and they're trying to wrestle what does this authority he brings actually mean? Yet Jesus hadn't come from any of their schools of training. You know, there was all these training schools going on for the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the different teachers and scribes. Jesus hadn't gone through any of their lessons, and yet he spoke with authority. And of course, it's important for us to remember in the Sermon on the Mount, we have Jesus here. He goes up onto a mountain and then delivers authoritative teaching from God. The audience would have immediately go back to Mount Sinai immediately to, to Moses, who brought, of course, the, the Ten Commandments, the law. This is what's in their minds here. And so they're, they're wrestling with it. They're thinking, what does it mean? Jesus speaks with authority. He's on a mountainside, and he's bringing this teaching, which feels different. It feels new. And add to that, um, of course, Joe explained in our first talk brilliantly this idea that, that God was throwing open the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven was now open for all, the poor, the broken, those looked down upon, the marginalized in society. And so the teachers in particular had some questions about what Jesus was doing here. What is he thinking? And this authority of Jesus meant that, that people, are be people being led away from the teachings of Moses by Jesus? Is that what Jesus has come to do? And in many ways, it was the fact that Jesus seemed to stand in opposition to the scribes and the teachers and the Pharisees that ultimately ends up getting him crucified. So people were already questioning, who is this guy? Who is Jesus? And what did his arrival mean for the Old Testament, the the Torah, the law, and the prophets, as it's referred to here. And so verse 17, let's work our way through this. Uh, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So Jesus gives them almost a direct response. It's like he Uh, He knows what they're thinking. There's a few places in the Gospels where it's like Jesus seems to know what the people are thinking before they even uh, say it. Uh, And so Jesus' response is like, I know you're thinking that this is what I'm saying, but this is not what I'm saying. He's very direct. I do not think, do not think this is what it's about. He couldn't be clearer. He's not come to abolish the law and the prophets. He had not come to make the journey of God's people as recorded in the Old Testament, irrelevant. And if you imagine the kind of journey of God's people up to this point was like this straight line going through, Jesus was not about to veer off course. He was not about to take a sharp handbrake turn and take it in a completely new direction, making the old one pointless. However it might appear, the ministry of Jesus is not a departure from the previous story, it's a continuation. He did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but fulfill them. So what does that mean, this idea of Jesus fulfilling the law and the prophets? Well, we're going to work our way through this. So firstly, the simple part of it is the prophets. What does it mean to say that Jesus fulfilled the prophets? Well, ultimately, it means that that Jesus was the goal. It was that he was the thing that the prophets were prophesying about. He was the end goal of what they were sharing in in the prophets. 
And the book of Matthew, of course, in particular, goes to great lengths to connect Jesus' ministry to the Old Testament. There's more quotes in uh, Matthew than in any other gospel relating directly back to a scripture from the Old Testament. So, and the degree to which Jesus actually matched these prophecies, which these prophecies in the Old Testament were kind of spread over hundreds and thousands of years, and yet the clarity they bring to what Jesus did is astounding. Everything from where he would grow up, his healing ministry, his death on the cross, all of it had been written about hundreds and thousands of years before. So Jesus fulfilled the hundreds of prophetic words in the Old Testament through his life, his death, and his resurrection. And for the observant, they could see this. Of course, many did miss it. So Jesus fulfilled the prophets in the sense that he was the one they prophesied about. He was the one they prophesied about. But now we've got to come to this idea of the law. And the law, of course, generally refers to the first five books of the Bible, which is the Torah, as as the, the Jews called it. And it can be helpful for us today to think about the law in three broad categories, and we're going to put those up on the screen. So the law has got the ceremonial law, the judicial law, and the moral law. So the ceremonial law is all the teaching in the Old Testament about purification and sacrifices and what went on in Israel's life in order that God could live in their midst. So this is all the stuff in the, in the temple, it's the tabernacle, it's all the teaching around the ceremonial law. And of course, they had to give various offerings that would be made at different times. And there's a lot of detail of this in the book of Leviticus. And and if you've ever tried to start reading the Bible from the beginning to the end, then Leviticus is the bit where you get stuck because you get into all the detail about how to organize this and you're thinking, how is this even relevant to me today? just, Just me? No? No? But this was the ceremonial law. This is the means by which God gave people a pattern that would enable God to live in their midst. So how did Jesus fulfill this part of the law? Well, this is where we look to the cross. Jesus fulfilled the ceremonial law by becoming the priest, the sacrifice, and the offering. So Jesus' death on the cross was what the ceremonial laws pointed to. Two, they, they were the foreshadowing of what Jesus was ultimately going to do on the cross. Unlike the ceremonial laws, the Bible talks about this in a few places, Jesus' sacrifice was enough to remove sins. Hebrews 10.4 says, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So they have this whole animal sacrifice system in the, in the Old Testament, but ultimately it wasn't actually able to, to remove sins. I'm sure if you were reading that now as, as a Jew, you'd be like, wait a minute, what? What was, what was going on there? So Jesus fulfilled the ceremonial law by meeting the requirements perfectly, dealing with sin uh, once and for all. And there is a sense in which the ceremonial system was abolished because Jesus fulfilled it. The laws described in the Old Testament were pointing forward to the fact that sin actually had to be dealt with. Sin was a real issue that had to be dealt with, but it was only Jesus that did that. And of course, when Jesus dies on the cross, we have that picture of the temple uh, curtain being torn open. And then not long after Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, the the temple in 70 AD was completely destroyed, and, and there's not been the same a sacrificial system for Jews ever since. So Jesus fulfilled the ceremonial law by becoming the sacrifice that was uh, prophesied about and foreshadowed through that. Next, we've got the judicial law. Uh, this is the part of the law that describes how the nation of Israel was to live. This was, uh, so God had a unique call for the nation of Israel. He called them out from amongst the people and said, Israel is going to be my representatives on earth. And it, the goal of that was that all the nations would be blessed through this nation of Israel. And as such, God had specific ways that they had to govern and rule and, and the way that they were to represent God on the earth. He gave them instructions on how to best live within the ancient Near East. 
how to look after people, how to manage land, how to honor God with uh, all that they had. They were to be God's representatives on the earth. And of course, Jesus lived as a Jew in Israel and he lived under the judicial law of the day. He fulfilled his duties. He followed the law of what it meant to be uh, someone in the nation of Israel. And that is ultimately how he fulfilled it by living out under the nation of Israel. But of course, the judicial law has changed for us today as Christians. With Jesus and the outpouring of his spirit, the church is birthed. Uh, People from all nations are now called out to live for God. Christians, disciples of Jesus, are now God's representatives, not just the nation of Israel. Now, I'm not going to get sidetracked onto the debates about the role of Israel in the future of the church because we could uh, go down lots of uh, rabbit warrens there. But it's safe to say that the New Testament, the primary message is that God has opened up salvation to the whole world, to us, to those who are not uh, Jews, to Gentiles. And of course, in 1 Peter 2.9, it says, uh, speaking to a group of people that are not Jews, he says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So the law relating to Israel as a nation no longer applies to us today. So we're in a different season of history. Finally, we come on to the the third one there, the moral law. And this is most simply captured in teaching like the Ten Commandments. And the truth of such teaching is universal. They provide a framework for morality in our world. and, And much of the teaching like the Ten Commandments has actually reshaped large parts of the Western world. So much of our uh, judicial systems and all of that within our country are fundamentally founded on the principles of the moral law in the Old Testament. Even though people try to remove values and change values, the problem they have is that the foundations of it sit upon these moral laws. And Jesus fulfilled these laws by living perfectly and without sin. And he was the first ever human to ever meet that standard. Uh, The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they they saw their job as to try and find creative ways to help people uh, obey the moral law. And they had different techniques, but none of them worked. Uh, And Jesus never disagrees with the law, but he does often disagree with the, the interpretation that the teachers of the law give it. So the Pharisees would often try to create allowances for circumstances. So, you know, and this is about to come up in our our teaching next, but as long as you um, don't actually kill someone, you can be as mean to them as you like, was effectively what they were saying. So they were like, this is a really hard commandment. So as long as you don't really actually go through the killing process, you can treat people however you like. So this is them trying to deal with the moral law in their own kind of ways, and Jesus is about to to deal with that. Or they would potentially also try to add additional laws around them. So rather than like if this little center circle is the, the law that was given, they would create these other rules around it to try and mean that you didn't even get close to it. So when it came to keep the Sabbath, for example, it was how many steps you could take on a given Sabbath day before it turned into work. Or it was like they're adding detail and, and they're, trying, they're actually making it more complicated. And, and so the result was they often misapplied the law and, and many others do. Uh, but Jesus not only obeyed the moral law, he obeyed the spirit of the moral law. And that is what we're about to get into with our future. He didn't abolish them, he fulfilled them. So that, that's a very high level view on that's how Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets. He didn't abolish them. So, look, reading on now, verse 18. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. 
So Jesus loved the law and the prophets. His life was actually marinated in those scriptures. These were the scriptures Jesus grew up with, he loved. We find out, of course, as a child, he's in the temple learning from the teachers about the the scriptures in the Old Testament. His mission was never to discount the Old Testament, but to bring it to fullness. And, And verse 18 tells us that until heaven and earth disappear, not a tiny bit, or I think it's like a jot or a tittle in some translations, Not a jot or tittle will be removed from from the law. Nothing will be changed in it. And it's until heaven and earth pass away. This is until Christ returns to make the world new. The law and the prophets will stand until then. So the question for us, I guess, is do we have the same love for the parts of Scripture that Jesus loved? Jesus loved the Old Testament. Do we as Christians still hold the Old Testament in high regard? And of course, verse 19, uh, he's saying that he didn't come to depart from the commandments of Scripture. And when we talk about grace as, as a Christian, it doesn't mean that we can now live how we like Jesus here stresses the importance of continuing to live out the law. In our case, the moral law. We're to practice a life that follows God's commands and teach others to live in the same way. It's important that when we talk about the gospel, we don't hear it as a license that we now get to live however we like. God still has commands and he still has ways for human flourishing. And ultimately, we need to see his law as life giving. It's not supposed to be a list of rules of things that we're not allowed to do. It's aimed to be life-giving. In verse 20, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So this is a very, this is the provocative verse here in this section. It's like, unless your righteousness passes, surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of law, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. It's quite black and white. But here we come to the core of Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. And I mentioned that these verses are in many ways the kind of intro to the rest of the kind of sections that will follow. So as we work through the future passages, we need to kind of keep this bit in mind because it's the kind of key that unlocks uh, the future passages. So I want you to imagine here the reaction to the crowd. So having told us earlier that the kingdom of heaven is now open to all, you know, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he then says that your righteousness must exceed that of the religious leaders of the day. You know, the people who spent their whole time studying the Bible, those poring over the law, keeping other people in check, and trying to follow God's law for the sake of the nation. You've got to be better than those people. I imagine most people at this point were thinking, what? Like, like this is the poor, the broken, the, the hurting, those who have just experienced the healing ministry of Jesus, who are not the clever ones, they're not the smart ones. And, and they're thinking, how on earth am I supposed to be like these, these teachers that seem so superior to me in every way? And if you were a Pharisee listening to this, I'm sure you were deeply offended. Do you know? What do you mean, more righteous than me? But what does Jesus mean? Well, firstly, we've got this idea of righteousness. And this, of course, is the focus of this section of the Sermon on the Mount, this idea of righteousness. How do we live righteous? Which is simply a way of saying, how how do we find right living? How do we live in such a way that we thrive in life? How do we have, as we've titled this series, the good life? as defined by the one who actually created it. So when we think of righteousness, we often think of a big long list of rules, things we're not allowed to do, uh, and things that just simply seem really hard uh, in order that we could just be acceptable to God. A slightly healthier way to see it is perhaps, what does it mean to live in such a way that life works best? What does it mean to live in such a way that life works best? God's commands are not some sort of arbitrary rules just to keep us busy down here on earth. They're not just some sort of checklist that he puts in front of us to see if we will fail. How how do we live a life of love, peace, and communion with God? That's what the law is designed to invite us into. And right living is an invitation to thrive as a human. 
God actually desires our best. You've got to have that at the core of your beliefs. He actually desires what's best for you. So what happens here in the sermon is a description of right living. And as we'll see, ultimately, it's about how to be love. So Jesus calls us to have a righteousness that surpasses the Pharisees. What does that mean? Well, firstly, it would be fair to say that the teachers and the Pharisees come under quite a lot of criticism from Jesus. I feel, I feel sorry for them sometimes. And if we're not careful as Christians, they become the kind of pantomime baddie where they just become like the, oh, don't be a Pharisee uh, or whatever it might be. However, the heart of the Pharisees was to actually seek after God. Unfortunately, they had a kind of messed up way to try and achieve it, but we need to recognize their heart was to steward what Israel had been given. But Jesus' biggest criticism of them was that they were so focused on outward obedience that they neglected inward obedience. They would pray in public and they would create rules that made it difficult for people. In other words, they, they, they take the pro- approach that doing the right thing is more important than being motivated rightly. As long as you don't actually kill someone, you can be as mean as you like. As long as you don't actually sleep with someone not your spouse, you can treat the opposite sex however you like. And they were using a a, a legal construct, if you like, rather than a relational construct. And that's what Jesus is about to reveal to them. Rather than living, how can I please God? It was more a case of what can I get away with? And righteousness that surpasses the Pharisees is to see the motive and the message behind the law. And as Jesus summarizes brilliantly for us, to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. And this call is both simpler to understand, but also in many ways harder. It's not just about doing the right things before God, but having the right feelings and the right motivations to God as well. A righteousness of heart, not just a righteousness of actions. And that's what Jesus calls his disciples to. And it's a challenging thought. And this isn't a departure from the law of the Old Testament, but actually the proper understanding and application of the law. And what's at stake here is everything. It's entering the kingdom of heaven, salvation, stepping into the reality of God's presence with us. So, you're already asking, how do we do it? How do we do this thing? How do we live uh, that kind of life? Well, the short answer is that there's nothing we can do. The problem was not just outward obedience, but our inner ability to follow God's commands. However, thanks to one of the many prophecies in the Old Testament, the answer has been provided for us. So, reading from Ezekiel, Uh, 36, starting at verse 26, Ezekiel prophesied this about what Jesus was going to do. He says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. A fantastic verse here. Do you know you've been given a new heart that God has put his spirit within you? And you see, the problem was an internal problem, so it needed an internal solution. God will give us a new heart, put his spirit within us, and the spirit at work in our lives will literally motivate us from the inside to obey God's law. That is, that is one of the roles of the spirit. He actually comes along and where we're not motivated and we're not drawn to the things of God, his spirit works in us and draws us uh, to live a life that is righteous. When Jesus talks about our righteousness needing to surpass the Pharisees, he's not talking about trying harder to be even better than the best people that we know. He's talking about the life of the spirit bubbling up within us. As that, as that thing, as, as it says there, that I'll put my spirit in you and move you internally to, to be careful to keep my laws. And of course for us, it's by grace. It's not earned, it's a gift. And this is the, the gift is the inner ability to follow what God has commanded. That's what the spirit gives us, the inner ability to follow what God commands. <clears throat> 
You see, God doesn't come along and lower the standard. He doesn't come along and say, all that law stuff from the Old Testament, all the stuff I call you to in righteousness, forget about that, now there's grace. That is not what he actually says. Grace isn't a license to not have to follow God. Grace is the empowerment to follow God. Grace is the means that he, it's like he enables you to be able to follow God. He doesn't lower the bar, he empowers us to reach it. And that's why the law is not bad. It just doesn't have the power to enable us to live it. So how, as we as Christians, do we relate to the law now? Well, I would describe it a bit like this. The law is not the means by which we become righteous, but it does reveal the path of righteousness. It's not the means, it's not the way that we become righteous, but it still does reveal what righteousness looks like. And this is picked up in lots of places in the Bible. Romans 8, verse 3 says this, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to to the spirit. Paul's saying the same thing here. He's saying the spirit is the one that enables us to live a righteous life. The law couldn't help us to be, to be righteous. And I love that. It's like Jesus fulfilled the requirements of the law in general by him living the requirements of the law. But it says according in this verse that he also fulfilled the requirements of the law in us. He, he fulfilled it in us. That's, that's powerful. Rules will never make us righteous. Only Jesus can do that. But the rules still reveal what righteousness looks like. So grace is not an opposite of law. Grace is the empowerment to fulfill law. And Paul in Galatians 3 picks this up in, in, in lots of ways. In the church in Galatia, he was writing to them to say, make sure you don't return back to living according to the law. I'm just going to pick out a few verses from Galatians 3, uh, and we'll put them up one by one. First one, verse 5, Paul says, So again I ask you, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by works of the law or by believing what you heard? He's saying here, don't go back. You know, he says, you foolish Galatians at the start of the chapter. Don't go back. God isn't working in your lives because of the law, but by believing in Jesus. And then uh, verse 10 for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not follow everything in the book of the law. In other words, if you, if you fail on the least command of God, you failed on them all. And, and that's why it says you're under a curse. But good news, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. He dealt with it. Good news, Jesus has lifted us. And then verse 24. So the law was our guardian, or schoolmaster, as some translations say, the law was our guardian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. It's faith in Jesus that makes us righteous. The law pointed the way. It, it was the, it was the path, this, this is what righteousness looks like. And in the Old Testament, nobody ever met up to the standard but Jesus comes, he meets the standard, and then he empowers us by his spirit to live that way. And Jesus is about to unpack this in more detail. Um, the, what does it actually mean to follow the spirit of the law, not just trying to analyze it and find uh, loopholes? What does it ultimately look like to live a life of love? So just summarizing for today, Jesus' life and ministry are not a sudden departure from the Old Testament. These words in the Old Testament were the words that Jesus grew up with. They're the things that he focused on. He was not dismantling the old, but he was bringing it to a completion in a sense. If the Old Testament was the question, then Jesus was the answer. And so we need to be careful that we don't fall into the trap of having a lower view of the Old Testament. We just need to have an appropriate view of it. 
The moral law of the Old Testament is not irrelevant to us. It continues to reveal what right living looks like. But as Paul says in Romans 7, the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. However, the law does not have the power to enable us to live differently. Only Jesus can do that. He lived a perfect life. He fulfilled the law and the prophets. Right living does not mean anything to do with us earning our salvation, but grace comes along and empowers us to live differently. And of course, our part in the journey is to, as it says in lots of places in the Bible, live by the Spirit. What does that mean? Well, it means to live aware of the Spirit. It means to be in dialogue with the Spirit in your life. It means to invite the Spirit to come and empower you daily and say, Spirit, come and empower me today to live for you. It means to listen, to be empowered And when we do that, that's when our righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers. And we get to live and enjoy the fruit of the kingdom of heaven. And the key to it all is just this empowerment by the Spirit. Not an extra burden of external rules, but rather than following external rules, becoming the kind of person who actually wants to live for God. That is the transformation that happens within us. Rather than needing to follow rules, we become the kind of people who actually just want to live for God. And of course, uh, I finish with uh, Jesus in Matthew 22, when he gets asked the question, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourselves. And in this verse here, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. If you could summarize all of them, this is what it would boil down to, love God and love others as you love yourself. And this is what the law boils down to, and God's spirit comes in our lives to enable us to live lives of love. And that's what right living is. That's what right living means. And in the coming weeks, we're going to be, Jesus kind of then unpacks it. He looks at different areas in which we as humans often fall and make mistakes and need God's grace. And he's about to look at uh, these sort of issues like anger, lust, divorce, speaking the truth, justice, war, and money. Of course, these things are completely irrelevant to today's world, aren't they? We've moved on from all of that. We don't need teaching on any of those topics, do we? No, the Sermon on the Mount is as relevant as ever. It speaks to the inner needs that we need, that we're called to live righteously. And I hope over the coming weeks that we can, we can understand better the good life that God calls us to. Let me pray, and as I pray, I don't know if Paul, if you wanna come up and get, get yourself ready, and we'll just finish with a, a song, whatever whatever you think feels appropriate. Um, But Lord, we just thank you right now for, we thank you for what you did on the cross, that you call us righteous now. You see us as holy and blameless in your sight, God. We thank you for grace. But we thank you that grace doesn't mean we just then get to do what we like. You've now empowered us to live by your spirit a life that is good, a life that is right, Lift off the burden of feeling like we must follow rules and stir in us a heart that's after you, God. A heart of love for others, a heart of love for you, and a heart of love that brings your life to the world around us, God. Help us, Jesus, to to love you more today. Amen. Thank you so much uh, for joining with us today. It's been great to have you along. As we've said before, uh, please do get in touch on email if you have questions, comments, things God's uh, doing in your life. We'd love to hear testimonies if God has done something uh, this week in your life that you want to share with us. We, we just love to celebrate good news. Um, so it's great to have you with us today. Please do pop in anytime you're in North Berwick. Uh, it's at 10.30 a.m. at North Berwick High School or we'll hope to see you next week online at 7 p.m. on Sundays on YouTube. But we're praying for you. We pray you have a blessed week uh, and we hope to see you soon. Bye.